Hey, this is Lawrence Funderburg from Huddle Up Coaching. I'm here to discuss building a healthy and thriving workplace in modern day America. Let's pour into the presentation. Now, given where our country has been over the past five to 10 years, is this even possible? Absolutely. I believe it is. And I'll share uh, some insights that would challenge you to sacrifice for the good of others without giving up who you are in the process. Now, sounds like a contradiction or double speak. Nope, it's not. The good of who you are stays while the uncomfortable parts of where you need to change get an upgrade. That's right. They get an upgrade. Now, building a healthy and thriving workplace in modern day America. It's been said that a picture is worth a thousand words. So let's look at some of these pictures and, and get an idea of where the American landscape is and that America is changing. It, it, it is changing. Uh, people can argue for the better or for the worse, but it certainly is changing. Now, we can see that the bottom left-hand screen here, we see skyscrapers in terms of buildings. So this would obviously typify corporate America. You'll see uh, a gentleman here with his hard hat on, construction worker. He's bringing his lunch pail. He's like, hey, I'm ready to go. Uh, and I love America. And then we have someone here who would maybe typify someone who works in, in, in the concrete business, working for maybe uh, Thompson Concrete in terms of masonry. And then we have someone who uh, is uh, blocked out, uh, but a picture of someone working on a machine. And then we have uh, a school teacher and seeing the changing landscape in terms of how America is changing, particularly when it comes to the racial uh, demographics. Now, uh, when it comes to this, now we have to understand that the American workplace should reflect a diversity on many fronts in America. I, I think most of us would agree with that. And, and it goes much deeper. Now watch this though, it goes much deeper than just skin color. We gotta think about this and you'll see what I mean throughout this presentation. Now, um, I'm Lawrence Funderburg from Ohio State and NBA player. I'm a team building consultant. And I'll just share a little bit about my background because I can't assume that everyone knows who I am. I mean, people who are from Central Ohio, and if you're above a certain age, let's say above 40 years of age, you may have heard of me before in the sports world. So I played at Ohio State. I played three years overseas before playing eight years in the NBA. And I'm going to talk about my overseas experiences and how it gives me some credentials to be able to discuss this particular subject. So this is me blocking Shaquille O'Neal. You probably heard of Shaquille O'Neal former NBA star uh, blocking his shot. Um, and he's pushing my arm out of the way by, by and it should have been an offensive foul uh, other than just a block shot. But uh, but you can uh, look at some of my highlights. I did dunk on Shaq, by the way. I got him one time. He dunked on me at least a dozen times, but I got him one time uh, being a big man. So um, uh, now uh, my uh, my real joy that I take uh, a lot of satisfaction in is, is the, on the intellectual, the education side. So I have three degrees. I love education. Um, and as I often say, even when you're not in school, you're always in class. You should always be learning. All right. You should always be learning. So uh, I got my undergrad degree in business finance from Ohio State. I was a dean's list student, graduated magna cum laude. And then I got my MBA when I was playing in the MBA because I knew one day that the ball would stop bouncing for Lawrence Funderburg. And what was I going to do with my life? Who cared about what I did on the basketball court? It didn't matter if my value proposition couldn't help them or their organization. It didn't matter. And then I've been a certified financial planner uh, for over 10 years now. So uh, I love education. And obviously, uh, being a team building consultant, just using my life experiences, particularly in sports, you learn so much and you realize that the business environment in the sports world, they overlap. There's a lot of sim symbolism in terms of symbiotic relationships between the two because uh, basketball or football or sports typically is much faster and the business world is a bit slower, but they have a lot of the same concepts uh, that cross over in, in, in one another for sure. Now, let's look at this quote right here. There's no I in blank, but there is in blank. All right. And we know, and many of you are familiar with this, there's no I in team, but you don't know the second half here, but there is in win. A winning team, organization, department or crew consists of a collection of vastly improved individual players. I think it's very important. So we can make it about the team, but at the end of the day, you need the individual players or employees to actually step up their game and they have to be vastly improved as well in order to have success at an organization. All right. 
So let's move to this quote right here. If employees are stuck, <clears throat> excuse me, in their ways, then they must make a decision to stay the course or embrace the path of growth. I think it's very important for you to understand what this actually means in terms of that. It's a binary choice. You either going to uh, remain who you are or you're going to grow into someone, uh, someone better. I think that's that's clearly the case. And I think work should be a place where you work on yourself. You don't just come to work and to get a paycheck. You should be working on yourself. I think it's very important for you <clears throat> to understand that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, um, why is that important? I think it's, it's, it's very important because we get stuck in our ways a lot of times. And if we get stuck in our ways, then that is going to not only impact us, but also our employers, our, our clients. I mean, it's, it's very important for us to understand that we should be growing into our full potential. Now, let's look at this particular quote right here. Um, and uh, it's, 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 I want you to think about this for a second as these words just kind of drop from the screen. I want you to look at these images right here, as I talked about. In, in America, the landscape of America is certainly... Um, is certainly changing. And I'll read this. So love is a universal language with a duty of care mandate to do no harm while caring for, working with, and being respectful toward others who don't look, think, or act like us or our affinity group. So affinity group is just a group um, that you identify with, right? So it could be a racial group. It could be a sports affiliation or affinity. It could be a religious affini affiliation. It could be a political affiliation. So these are affinity groups which you kind of align yourself with, but I think it's very important. And, 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 and here's something that I ask. I'm a father, okay? I have, I have a daughter in college, I have a son in high school, and some of you may have, have asked this question to yourself or may, maybe out loud. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to the American workplace, right? What will the American workplace offer my child or children when they enter it? And I think it's a, it's a legitimate question because without love, not much. It's not going to offer much because if work is just a job, then loving what you do will be a chore. Let me say that again. If work is just a job, then loving what you do will be a chore. So it won't matter. And neither will the concern for the people around you if, if, you're, if your job is seen as a chore. I think it's very important for you to understand. It's going to be heavy, but this is the type of messaging that is needed in order to grow because you're going to have to be uncomfortable. That's really how you grow into your change. Now, um, let's look at this slide right here. All right, because we're going to talk about 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 change and what that actually means. But it's but there are a lot of other components that have to work and and work out uh, in order to have change. Okay. Now, um, now when you look on the left side here, you have the process, right? You have chance, you have choice, you have change. So you must take advantage of the chance to make the right choice in order to produce a desired change. I think it's very important to understand that. And then that's how you have growth or progress. It's very important. And I have right here, get up to speed in the process or get left behind in the progress. You'll see this snail going at a snail's pace, you see, but eventually this snail will end up in a better place. So eventually. So don't worry about the small steps or you don't really see the gains. Just keep growing. Just keep uh, maintaining your process because eventually you're going to have the progress. I think it's very important for you to understand. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I've been there. I've been stuck in a rut where I know I needed to grow in a given area and the body will always fight to keep what it knows until an incentive or a compelling reason is presented to grow. It's very important for you to understand that. And when when love grab a holds of you, particularly in a work environment, there is a duty and obligation to make it about others and not ourselves. It's very important for you to understand. And I know this is not easy in a get your hands dirty environment like construction. I understand that. But it's absolutely necessary, it's imperative to create a healthy and thriving workplace regardless of one's occupation. And it has a lot to do with you, it has a lot to do with you. Now, we know that everyone is given an opportunity. You can go to work or you can allow work to work on you. But I think it's very important for you to understand what do you want to get out of work. And work should be a place where you grow into being a better, a better person, not just a better employee. 
So why am I qualified or, or given the, the, the opportunity to address this controversial subject matter? I'm going to throw out several things here. So I grew up <clears throat> in an environment where uh, I grew up in public housing. Uh, I grew up on the west side of Columbus, Ohio. It was, it was con considered the bottoms. That's the name. If you're from Columbus, Ohio, if you're familiar with Columbus, Ohio, you know that the west side is considered the bottoms. All right. And you, our neighborhood was called Sullivan Gardens Housing Projects, which was the roughest, the toughest, the baddest, the meanest, most dangerous housing project in all of central Ohio. And basically all of the residents were African-Americans, uh, almost all of them. And then on the other side of 70 West, you had individuals and families from Appalachian descent. Yeah. And it was very interesting because, you know, uh, there were some racial tensions, no doubt there. But we went to school together. We played sports together. And the one thing that we had in common, even though we didn't have the same skin color, was certainly the struggle in terms of the poverty uh, situation. Um, and, um, you know, I played sports uh, with a, a lot of the individuals, uh, my classmates that were from Appalachian descent uh, on the, in the bottoms area. And we played football together, uh, hung out at school. And, um, you know, it was just a great experience. Uh, and you get a chance to know people. Uh, particularly when you're around them on a consistent basis and you choose to get to know them by investing in time in that relationship. I think it's very important. Now, and the reason why I share that is because I think it's very important for you to understand the fact that I, I want to provide context before I present content to make contact with you. I think it's very important. And always think about that when it comes to don't deliver the content before you establish the context because you'll never have a chance to make contact with someone if, if, if you don't get that, that equation right. Now, um, <clears throat> I feel that, 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 that I have uh, a lot of things working in my favor when it comes to this because I lived overseas for three years. And a lot of people complain about America, but I say, look, go live overseas uh, and you'll get a chance to see that America it has, its, has its flaws, as I, I talk about. America has a dirty past, but it also has a nutrient rich future. So we do know that in America, but when you live outside of this country, you realize how many blessings you actually have being in America. So I lived uh, in Greece for a couple of years. I spent, spent time in France and in Israel. I also lived uh, for a short time in, um, in Italy. I've been to about almost a dozen countries um, outside of America and you learn a lot. You learn a lot and you learn a lot about connecting with people, even though you can't speak their native tongue, because you have to really pay attention to their body language, which I'm going to talk about here shortly. OK, now here's what I know about people. First, people can not avoid being people. OK, no matter how hard they try or where they live, they can't avoid being people. Second, people need help, especially in the area of biochemical well-being. So what are you talking about biochemical well-being, Mr. Fundy? Well, this is why, why people feel the way they feel. So anything that the body feels <coughs> or senses, this is the biochemical. Now, third, people can grow into their potential with the right incentives or reasons, frameworks or game plans, and upgraded values or non-negotiable principles. So I think it's very important for you to understand what I mean there. Now, um, <clears throat> So when, you, when you're overseas and you play in a different country, in particular, you're playing basketball, you can't understand your teammates a lot of times. So you got to really pay attention to the body language. Sports has its own language, so to speak. And this is what I think people appreciate, the beauty of how you can uh, not actually communicate, but be on the same page and actually produce, you know, a, a, a beautiful thing on the football field or basketball court or in a swimming pool or, or whatever, or baseball field or baseball diamond, it's very important that you're playing uh, and operating on the same page and in the same playbook, I think is very important. Now, let's look at, at this. So T. Connie says, is, is, how are you doing uh, in, uh, in Greek? Uh, I learned a lot uh, of my, my time spent, spent in Greece and France and in Israel and Italy. And you learn a lot about paying attention to the nuances of languages and not being arrogant. I think this is the problem where Americans, we just assume that because we're the dominant player on the world stage, right, then, then this means that our supporting actors or actresses don't deserve the same attention or don't deserve the same respect when it comes in a native tongue. We know that that's, that's false, okay? That's false. Now, um, 
let's look at this right here, this last slide where we have, obviously you have a group of guys, street ball uh, playing outside on the left side. And then you obviously have a more a team, more structure setting uh, uh, here on the right. And you see it obviously very diverse, uh, um, um, obviously team. Uh, and a team is only as effective as the resolve of its players to sacrifice for one another while being committed to championship level performances. What does this mean? What it means if you work for Thompson Concrete, that means that as a team member, you must bring your game. In. And I know this because when you play sports, right? And I was the center at Ohio State, and when our guards didn't play good defense, they would have let their 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 player get to the basket, and then I had to try to block the shot. And sometimes I would get I would get a foul because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. So I think it's very important that every team member brings their best, their A game to the table. I think it's very important for us to understand that, uh, whether it's in the sports world, the business world, uh, whether it's at home, you got to make sure that you bring your best game and that everyone is operating as a team. All right, so let's look at this last uh, point right here. Now, I was fortunate enough to win the NBA's first ever hometown here in the month award. Um, I was uh, just a role player in the NBA, certainly had much more acclaim uh, when I was in college. I played overseas, played in high school in terms of being a feature player. But when I was in the NBA, I was just a role player. And, and, and I was competing against Grant Hill, who was an NBA superstar, Dikembe Mutombo. You probably know him. No, no, no. You know his favorite uh, tagline in terms of his hand when he would block shots. But I was able to win the first ever Hometown Hero of the Month award. And I said, man, why, why, why me? Why, why would that? Because these guys do outstanding work. There were many other people who do outstanding work. Why do they recognize me? And I think a lot of it had to do with the experiences that I, uh, I provided, particularly the young people, their families, and really giving them an experience that is unforgettable. And I think that's important. And you'll see what I mean by that when you work alongside someone is very important. So we, 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 we provide them with great experiences in terms of field trips and all the things that we did uh, with them. But we always had a meal for them. And we typically went to a really nice restaurant. We broke bread together. And there were people from all walks of life. Right. There were Hispanic Americans. There were Asian Americans. There were Caucasian Americans. There were African Americans. There were Pacific Islander Americans. We had all of these different individuals from various ethnicities, and that when you break bread, you get a chance to really learn about people. You actually absolutely do. So I'm going to come back to that. It's going to be one of our tips in terms of how you can have better communication without actually being able to speak someone's native tongue. That's going to be one of my tips. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. So let's look uh, here. So English may be the world's default language, but this does not make it superior to another's native tongue. And I think it's very important for us to understand, to respect all people's native tongues, but at the same time, understand the universal language of communication can be something that we all get right. And we're going to talk about that in a minute here. Now, um, listen here. Now, when you live overseas, and, and this goes segues right into this slide right here, pr building productive and stable workplace relationships, you realize that that this, and I and I realize this, that I, I've learned a great deal about the language of respect for others through their native tongue. Did you get that? I've learned a great deal about the language of respect about others through their native tongue. And I think it's very important for us to appreciate the beauty and the diversity that all languages have, I think is very important. Now, uh, building productive and stable workplace relationships. And my question is, are you committed to this task of building productive and stable workplace relationships? Are you, are you really committed to that task? And that if it's gonna happen, it's gotta start with you and you and you and you, all of you who are listening to this presentation, it has to start with you. So let's get into the five tips to better communications in spite of a language barrier. All right, now tip number one. So check your body language. So check your body language. A very important, I'm gonna hammer home this point for quite a while and why it's important for you to check your body language. And my first question is how proficient are you in interpreting or disseminating, giving off the cues and clues of language? Are you smiling authentically, right? Or are you frowning when a colleague comes into your personal space? You can build bridges with an inviting smile. 
It's very important for you to understand that. And agitation, if you're always agitated, this actually communicates a great deal as well, such as, why are you bothering me? You haven't said anything, but the agitation that you're giving off has communicated everything. All right. Now, do you show distance or entrance when it comes to your hands and your feet? Do you show distance or entrance? Here's what I mean. Trustworthiness can be expressed through our hands. So if we think about this, right, if we show our hands, if we uh, show people and, and we invite them into our space, this can, 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 can diffuse a lot of tensions, particularly in work environments where there's a language barrier. And what I mean by this, and here's the, the connection trifecta. If you have a hand wave, if you have a sincere smile and a nod, that can go a long way and communicate a great deal. And then also never turn your back when someone is communicating to you or whatever, because this shows the ultimate sign of disrespect. All right. And, and I often say that unless you're busy, right, you can always say, hey, I got to I got to get back to my work. And then a person will say, hey, do you understand what I mean? I think it's very important because I think you want people to be respectful at all times, even when they're busy. OK. And then always say, give someone your undivided attention and your undervalued attentiveness, your undivided attention, okay, your eyes and looking at them, and then your undervalued attentiveness, where you're actually paying attention. You may not be able to understand what they're saying, but you're watching their body language in that you're, you're giving them your undivided attentiveness to truly try to understand what they're saying and what they're communicating, even when there's a language barrier. Now, let me ask this right here before I move to the second point here is we know that uh, that there is an art and a science part when it comes to nonverbal communication. So the, the art part is the personal touch that you put on it. And then the science is the technical approach that you bring to the table. Now, if your colleague is confused or is afraid, don't add to your crew members angst. Now, you can diffuse the tension. All right. By politely saying to a Spanish speaking colleague, no comprende, por favor, habla, and then use your hands to show, say, hey, won't you slow down a little bit so I can understand. So I think it's very important. And then you don't have to know a lot of words, but if you can take time to, to, to understand some words, I think it can go a long way in terms of being able to communicate. And certainly communication is a two way street. It's not just trying to understand Spanish better. I think Spanish speaking employees need to obviously try to learn that to speak English. I think it goes both ways. OK, now um, now what you say should politely uh, line up with respectful and respectable body language, respectful and respectable body language uh, can go a long way. Now, uh, don't tilt your head back. Don't lean back. I think when you do that, that creates distance and certainly can communicate arrogance as well. So I think it's very important for you to understand if you close the distance, you can get a chance to actually know people better. And again, it takes time. I get it. You know, it takes time. But certainly you should get take the time to really understand. Now, here's the closeout for checking your body language. You ready for this? Watch this. 70 percent of communication, nonverbal communication. 70 percent is nonverbal. 70 percent of communication is nonverbal. Now, that means there's only 30 percent left over. So if you can get to 70 percent right, you will have a fighting chance at what's left over or the 30 percent. So you can let math work for you rather than against you. All right. So let's move on to the um, to the next point right here. And this is you have to be cognizant of your tone of voice, your tone of voice, how you talk. And if you have children, you understand the tone of voice. You may say a word that sounds or, 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 or is, is a word that can be interpreted as being polite. But if your kid is listening to the tone and it's said in a very negative way, it doesn't matter because the kid is picking up on the tone. Same way with employees, it's very important. So we're going to look at this, an example we have right here, Tommy, he has a, a, a Spanish speaking co colleague who's approaching him, he's busy and he can see him out of the corner of his eye. And then here's what he says. What do you want, damn it? So he's very upset. Everybody's watching it like, man, he's upset. And then you can feel the tension in the room based on his response. OK, and, um, and 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 how could he have handled that? Maybe he says and you see here he's got a better uh, uh, disposition in terms of he's smiling. Que pasa or que paso, Jose, means what 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 has happened? You know, what's going on? 
I think if your tone of voice can go a long way, you combine that with a smile. And again, you could be busy. All right. But take the time to actually convey a mutual level of respect. It can go a long way in your tone of voice. And there are various tones, particularly negative tones. Right. There are hostile tones. There are frustrated tones. There are uh, belittling tones. I think it's very important for you to understand that your crew me crew members should not be walking on eggshells when they're around you. So check your body language. Now, pay attention to your tone of voice. So let's look at number three here. We see this particular individual is blowing uh, a fuse, so to speak, in terms of blowing steam off. So the art of decorum in the workplace, this goes a long way, okay? Whether inside or outside the workplace, you gotta have decorum, I think is very important. So let's talk about this and what this means. Now, you're in an environment where there are pressing deadlines that, 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 that have to be met. All right, but this should not cause you to be dead to decorum. Now, this means that your personal decorum and or organizational culture should go hand in hand. They absolutely should. So decorum is just a fancy word for displaying proper behaviors or showing etiquette and how you treat others inside and outside of a work environment. Now, watch this. Codes of appropriate conduct don't need a password since they should never go offline. Never go offline. Now, pressure may bust pipes. You probably heard that before, but it can't break a person at peace. It cannot. So you can hold people accountable, but you have to extend grace at the same time. You got a job to do. I understand you got a crew. You have a job to do. But every member must contribute to the success of a project. And if you have an environment of peace, it's a better environment to work in. I'm sure you have to understand that. And I'm sure you do understand that in terms of that. And um <clears throat> Now, listen to this right here. The peace you give, the P-E-A-C-E -E you give is the peace, P-I-E-C-E, -E, someone receives. So if you're someone who creates an environment of peace, that can be passed on to others. And I think it's very important. And that is really what decorum is all about. Um, and um, <clears throat> let's look at the next one here. Now, embrace two-way dialect with colleagues or crew members. So here's a quote. We speak and understand best our native language. We feel most comfortable speaking that language. The more we use the secondary language, the more comfortable we become conversing in it. So Gary Chapman um, is an author and counselor. So let's look at this. Let's look at John and, and, and Manuel. So I see John, he's rocking his cowboy hat and then uh, Manuel, his sombrero. So we're gonna look at this and we're gonna uh, look at their common goodies or common ground and their common good, okay? So I want you to think of common goodies as being the dialogue and the common good, which is being the dialect, all right? And there's a big difference between the two, all right? So even if you can't have the dialogue in terms of spoken language, native tongue, you should certainly have the common good or the dialect. Again, this is taking the time to be able to still communicate even if there's a language barrier present. All right, so let's look at these right here. So we have uh, both of these uh, individuals um, in our, our employees, uh, on, on equal footing. They do outstanding work. They're men who prioritize family, their fathers, and more importantly, their dads. They really get it uh, in terms of being engaged with their children. Um, and then obviously they have excellent work ethics. I think it's uh, a very, a very uh, commendable thing. These are the common ground or the common goodies between them. So let's look at the common good because uh, uh, John only knows a couple of words of Spanish. Manuel doesn't speak uh, any English presently, but certainly both should find ways to be able to communicate uh, with one another effectively nonetheless. So let's look at the common good. So teamwork is paramount, mutual respect has no borders, and the alignment of convictions and values. And when I mean alignment of convictions, I'm talking about personal convictions and organizational values. Now, what that means is if you work for a company then conforming to their standards should be the norm, not the exception. You work for them, they don't work for you. I think it's very important, although they should respect their employees uh, to a high degree, employees have to understand that they work for their employer. All right, and then taking the time to understand each other. I think it's critically important understanding the nuances and the mannerisms of others can go a long way. And again, I see people um, who who just don't want to invest in getting to know their employees and they're losing out on a wonderful opportunity, uh, perhaps. So let me leave you with, with this two, uh, two final points when it comes to two-way dialect. 
First, the greatest respect you can show a colleague or crew member is to appreciate who that person is and where he or she comes from. Now, this doesn't mean that they don't have things to work on. We all do. We're all work in progress. All right. And every one of us, you know, can 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 grow and, and, and improve in, in certain areas. Every one of us. It doesn't matter how seasoned we are in life. Second, people can work together for years, as I mentioned, and not really know each other. I think that's a great tragedy in a work environment. Now, let's look at this last one, which I talked about, number five, and I pointed this out. I'm probably making some of you hungry right now. I don't know if it's lunchtime that you're listening to this, um, or maybe it's shortly after breakfast, and you see this, and you say, man, where is that place? <clears throat> now, we can break bread with one another to feed and to be fed. That's why it's not just the food. It's, it's more importantly, what's going on underneath the hood in terms of the biochemistry. So uh, this quote right here, um, this just came to me um, and, and, and I always like to refer uh, to this uh, because when you think about this, it is very profound in terms of that because I wasn't searching this out. I wasn't really thinking and all of a sudden like, man, that is really how it is when perfect strangers can become best friends over a great meal. I've seen people who didn't know each other. I met people. I didn't even know them at all. And it's almost like I knew those people for the rest of my life, or I've known them since my entire life, I should say, and, and that I will know them for the rest of my life because of the time we took to break bread. And more importantly, what's going on in terms of how we are, are feeling underneath the hood. And this is the biochemistry, the serotonin and dopamine. You probably heard of these, these, these neurotransmitters. Now, Let's look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So you see at the base is the physiological, then safety, love and belonging, esteem, self-actualization. So basically your foundational, these are things that, that, that Maslow uh, said that human beings actually need, right? These are foundational. And then obviously when it comes to hunger, I talked about that in terms of breaking bread together, but it goes much deeper than satisfying one's hunger. And this is where, um, when I talked about the neurotransmitters and the serotonin, right? And then the dopamine. So serotonin is your feel good apparatus. So feeling good, you know, having joy about life, that's serotonin. And then dopamine is your motivation. Now here's what's interesting. 95% of serotonin is produced in your gut. And then 50% is produced uh, of, of dopamine is produced in your gut. Think about this. Now, if you dread working with someone or working around someone, think about what happens to your serotonin level. Think about what happens to your dopamine, your feel good, your motivational level. Think about what happens to the productivity. Think about how that impacts the company. Again, that's why this is so important for you to understand how this comes into play. And are you adding to or subtracting to your crew member's biochemical bank account? I think it's very important for you to understand what this actually means. OK, and um, let's go to. This next slide here, insecure, all right? And I'm going to talk about this. So this is going to be a bit personal, but I want you to really think about where we are right here. I think it's very important for you to get this, okay? When people feel threatened, their insecure dark side comes to the surface, all right? This is a good friend of mine, Dr. Anthony Phillips. He's from Appalachian, Ohio. He's white, medium build, uh, medium height, um, and uh, has a great heart. He's a, he's a proud patriot. We don't see eye to eye on a lot of things when it comes to racial or even maybe some of the pol political posturing that's out there. But there's one thing is, is that we have tremendous respect and love for one another. And, and, and I, I treat him like my brother because he literally helped save my life. So I have mad respect for him and, and our relationship is unshakable regardless of what is going on in terms of the racial climate in America. And um, I have some other stories to share that will tie in uh, with this about Dr. Uh, Anthony Phillips. But I want you to really think about insecure and how when people feel threatened, they always they can lash out at other people. They can talk about other people. They can put other people down. And I think sometimes we focus on the behavior. Then we should really think about the individual. And I think that's very important. And you have to separate the person from the behavior. And I'm going to um, come back to this. Now, let's look at appropriate language when it comes to communication guidelines and conversational guardrails. So we have uplifting compliments. We have positive affirmations. We have heartfelt congratulations. I think it's very important. And then, sh again, showing it, you know, just a fist bump like that, man, you know, clapping for someone, 
you know, smiling at someone. It can go a long way. You don't have to say anything, but that is communicating a great deal. All right. So let's look at inappropriate je gestures, right? Racially insensitive jokes. We know these go on in the workplace. Um, foul language, reckless words. <coughs> we have to really think about these gestures and how they actually affect other people. And they do in a profound uh, way. Now, let's look at this right here. What's the big deal with words? Here we, here, we, here we go right here. You ready for this? First, hurtful words dehumanize people. They certainly do. We've heard a nursery rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. If you're from America, you've heard that, and you know that's an absolute lie. That's not true. Okay, words do hurt, particularly what people say about one another. It does hurt, okay? And we know that it dehumanizes people because it places people in a defensive position rather than an offensive posture. We know if you're playing more defense than offense in sports, you're typically going to lose the game. And we no doubt, no doubt know that put downs are a dehumanizing contest. But on this podium, there are no winners, only losers. So think about that. Be careful what you say, what you text, you know. And I think it's very important, the conversations you have even after you leave work. All right, let's look at the next one. Second, hurtful words delegitimize people meaning they treat people uh, uh, as being less than while stripping away the essence of their humanness. That is a very, very, very degrading thing to do. And put downs are all about compare and contrast uh, and the contest. That's what they are. Now, the unfavorable group never measures up. Watch this. And while the favorable group always measures down. What do I mean by that? Meaning that they sit high, they stoop low, by talking bad about colleagues or crew members. It's very important, okay? It very much hurts when you talk about other people. But again, you gotta deal with who is what's going on on the inside. I'm gonna come, back, come to that. Now, third, hurt for wor words depersonalize people, meaning they deprive people of their dignity because they feel boxed in. And when you box in a person or a group based on some stereotype, this short circuits their right to grow into their full potential as human beings. It certainly does. And again, it is snatching or depriving this opportunity from them. And it's akin to Grand Theft Auto. Watch this. You've stolen the vehicle that should have been used to, to, to drive or fuel their personal and professional growth. That's what you've done when you've depersonalized them. That's why hurtful words actually mean a great deal and they have a devastating impact. Okay. So let's look at this right here. What drives the derogatory remarks towards others? I know it. I've been there. I've been in that dungeon. I've, I've been the crude mood dude in terms of uh, sour moods because of me. And, and particularly when you have a lot of influence, it, you can take the, root, the air right out of the room. OK, and transparency is the key to helping people break free from what's holding them back. So I've got to be honest with you because I think it's the best way for you to grow, for us to grow together. All right. Now, the battle raging inside the individual with the coarse language can't contain the blazing inferno at his own doorsteps. Did you get that? I think it's very important. And a lot of this, no one talks about this, and particularly in a corporate setting, but I think it's very important for us to understand. Now, let's look at this. Three heartfelt tips for consideration. Okay, tip number one, pay careful attention to your heart because the issues of life flow out of it. Okay. What do I mean by that? How can a person actually uh, work on their heart? Well, you identify the hurt from within to stop the hurt going out. It's very important, a lack of internal peace. If you don't have internal peace, right, this, this will create turmoil in someone else's life. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. All right. And I know this because I speak from personal experience. Let's look at number two. Repeat tip number one until your heart change is evident for others to experience and enjoy. All right. When will this be evident? But more importantly, uh, uh, for all to see, when will it be when people feel the presence of your authentic love, the head change, the head change has transitioned into a heart exchange. It's very important. I'm pointing to my heart right here. OK, it's very important. And again, people are going to see they're going to feel it. They're going to know it. All right. Let's look at this next one right here. Here's a big one. Grasp the fact that that you share 99% of the same DNA as everyone on the planet. Now, we let this 1% difference in terms of our, our skin color, in terms of maybe our features, uh, our stature, our height, or, 
our weight or, or some other factors divide us. When in reality, if we get underneath the skin, we'll see that we're 99% the same, okay? That, that means a lot. And I think for us, we have to realize that we make, we make things sometimes about racial or social or political leanings when in reality, right, we're part of the human race, the human family, okay? And that if we if, if if points one and two or tips one and two are going to mean anything, we got we got to understand that tip one and three can actually bring them all together, right? I think it's very important. So let's look at the Great Wall of Separation. Not much longer here to go. So helping hurting people heal. I think it's very important, and it's a little bit different than probably uh, some of the other uh, workshops or. Uh, presentations that maybe you've had at Thompson Concrete. It's a little bit different, but I think it's very important because at the end of the day, we're dealing with people and it doesn't matter. People are people, as I said, and a lot of times people are dealing with their own pain. That's why they're taking it out on other people. So here is uh, my man right here. And as I often say, you have to separate the person from the inappropriate behavior because sometimes people do things, they say things because of what has been done to them. Again, be very empathetic and sympathetic to others, I think can go a long way. And the reason why I say this is because um, I was invited uh, to uh, an event. It was a faith-based event in Hocking Hills, which means this is Appalachian, Ohio. I had a friend of mine who attended with me. He was African-American like me, and uh, we're both light-skinned, but still African-American. As I often say, that black is not a color, but a shade. And we're there, and, and, and everybody is, is, is white. Uh, they all, all these pickup trucks. I've never seen so many pickup trucks in my life at one place. And um, I was like, whoa, what, what's going to happen down here? And then these guys start pouring out their heart. I start pouring out my heart. And it was almost like I gave them permission and privilege to actually deal with a lot of pain in their own life, particularly when it comes to racism. Yes. And, and I had guys who said, look, they said, you're the first black person I've ever hugged in my entire life. And I had guys, they were laying on my sh shoulder, crying and bawling like a baby because they said, you unlocked something in me. You allowed me to be free. And I didn't realize that I hated someone just because of the color of the skin or more importantly, because of how my life was going and my condition of my life. So and as I say that, I don't care who you are. Right. I don't care who you are. If you're a white supremacist, it doesn't matter what the situation is. Everybody has a right to grow into their change. Absolutely. OK, whether they look, think or act like me. And the reason why that's important, because you can see the angst of this of this woman right here. She's struggling. She's hurting. And there's a lot of people in America <coughs> are hurting. Excuse me. And you might have to take that call because it, it just might be the only person that this individual reaches out to is you. Right. And if you can't be reached, then that person may say, man, why should I? Why should I be around? Because a lot of people live to go to work and that if their work is not a not of family to them, they can say, well, why do I have anything to live for? Particularly if they're single, they don't have kids or if they don't have a family or whatever the case may be outside of work. And they feel like that their family at work rejects them. That's a very bad place to be. And I tell people, be very careful. OK, listen to me. OK, people are hurting right now and people are very fragile right now. And I'm not saying that this, this excuses their work ethic. No, not at all. OK, but you got to be able to listen to the pain in people's hearts to be able to help them, you know, because, yes, people got a job to do. But you also have a job to do to work on them while they're at work. OK, and help them and yourself. OK. So let's look at this under the microscope. We have cross cultural collaboration in the workplace. Um, and, 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 and I only have a few more slides left here. Um, so cultural capital, we hear the term diversity, equity, inclusion. It's something over the past four or five years that people have poured a lot of focus and intention in, particularly with George Floyd and the protests and the Black Lives Matter movements and all of these things that have gone on in America. But I focus more on cultural capital because where DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion falls short, cultural capital picks up. Here's my definition that I came up with. The goodwill generated by an organization uh, in meeting the needs fulfilling expectations uh, within reason and addressing the concerns of employees from diverse backgrounds. So I think it's very important that we understand that, that everybody should benefit in an organization, not just a particular subset. And I think that's where sometimes DNI programs can fall short. And if there's no emotional safety net, people are not gonna be transparent. 
And then that program is just going to fall to the ground. So there has to be an emotional safety net and people got to be able to be free to express and to share without reprisal or without some type of judgment against them if if they say the wrong thing. I think this is the problem where we are in America. Now, let's look at the three C's of cultural capital. You have class, which is your social status in life. Most people look at it from a financial perspective. You have color or your racial stamping in life in terms of how you identify in terms of ethnicity. And then condition is your positional standing in life. So this could be your education, your environment, your experiences would make up your condition. So let's look at the advantages of cross-cultural collaboration in the workplace. Now, there are also some disadvantages, but I think there are way more advantages than disadvantages. So let's look at this. Diverse groups in the workplace tend to perform better than non-diverse groups. They absolutely do. Yeah, because you bring a, a, a different lens and a different way of looking at things because of your cultural footprint and fingerprint. It's very important for people to understand this. Now, let's look at this. Diversity can drive creativity and teamwork when group cohesion has been firmly uh, established. I think it's very imp important. And, and cohesion is the glue that brings things together. I think it's very important for people to understand what that actually means, okay? Now, um, when it comes to... Uh, to this is it's, it's, it's a requirement that everybody has to bring a certain level of work to the table in order for this to, to materialize uh, as expected. Now let's look at number three. So growth gains can be achieved personally, professionally, and philanthropically in a diverse working environment. They certainly can. And uh, this means that there are benefits inside and outside of work. And I call it the spillover effect. Because if you're if it's sincere and if and if if who you are at work can spill over into who you are outside of work, then there can be those great gains even on the home front, even in a community is very important for you again to work on yourself while you're at work. Now let's look at number four here. Morale and momentum often go up when collaboration among diverse employees settles in, but should never settle down. And I would even add mission to the, the M's there, morale, momentum, and mission, because I believe these actually bring together the diversity initiatives in terms of that. And now this is going to be, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be uncomfortable and it can be a bit messy, but it's certainly very necessary. So I think uh, there's no growth that can exist without its fair share of the right kind of friction. So let's look at number five. Improves bond, bonding relationships and binding commitments to work in unison while appreciating the diversity of group members. I think it's very important uh, that the bonds of relationship and the bonds, uh, the binds of commitments are pulling, are pulling people to a better place. And I think it's a beautiful thing to behold when everyone is operating on the same page and in the same playbook. It's a beautiful thing to behold because because diversity uh, is allowing itself to flourish. Now, there are going to be some hiccups, some hangups, and some holdups along the way. That's, that's, that goes without saying, but certainly the advantages actually outweigh the disadvantages. Let me leave you with this before I, I go into my last slide, okay? A model for appropriate cross-cultural behavior is better than the mode of conformity. Let me say that again. A model for appropriate cross-cultural behavior is better than the mode of conformity. What do I mean by that? When you model cross-cultural collaboration, as I outlined in these five advantages, no mode is, 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 is required. You don't need a mode, right? Because the model is enough and you don't need to be forced into a mode because organically you're growing into the model that has been laid for you in terms of the cross-cultural collaboration. You don't need to be forced into anything because it is naturally happening and this is an organic thing. And I think anytime, and this sometimes is why DNI programs can fall short because they're manufacturing, they're fabricating the growth and development as opposed to incentivizing people that this is the right thing to do and that it should happen organically. Certainly you can facilitate, but you don't want to fabricate. Facilitate, but don't fabricate in terms of people's growth. And this is the big problem I have with D and I versus cultural capital, which is what I put forth. All right, let's look at this last um, one. And you're probably going to recognize this individual who popped up on the screen. Yes, the game's greatest player of all time, basketball, Michael Jordan, and possibly the greatest athlete of all time. 
But first, you see the culture right there. You see people around the table kind of having a kumbaya moment. Without question, culture takes time. It takes work. And though it may be something that people aspire for, again, it doesn't mean it's guaranteed that it's going to happen in a work environment or even in a home or even on a basketball or football team. OK, now here's culture. Here's my definition. It is an atmosphere, environment or setting in which sustained excellence can flourish. Why do I have Michael Jordan here? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to have to clear my throat because that's exactly what I had to do when he shared some things with me when I was talking trash to him, which wasn't smart to do. Yes. And that I do highlight that in my book, Momentum Power Play, which some of you will get a copy of this book right here, this autographed book. But suffice it to say, I was talking trash and he put me in my place and I can't repeat the words because uh, it was very inappropriate words that he shared with me. But I had no business talking trash to him as a hot shot rookie. OK, so he was right for putting me in my place. All right. And basically he said, hey, this is not Ohio State, Lawrence. I was like, wow, Michael Jordan used to watch me play in college. Yeah, because they want to see the competition. Who's going to um, uh, who, who's going to be playing? And by the way, we beat North Carolina. Uh, in the NCAA tournament uh, to go to the uh, to advance on to the uh, the, the final eight, uh, the, or the elite eight. And obviously, I'm sure he was watching that game. Um, and I was one of my best games in the tournament that year. So uh, so, yeah, talking trash to him. But he basically said, listen, he said, you got to bring it every day if you want to have success in this league. And it's the same way when it comes to work. And I always say win the first 30 minutes of the workday. And if you do that, that can set the tone for the rest of your day and not only the rest of your day, but how you deal and work with other people. Did you get that? This is the culture. This is the, the, the responsibility that you have, that your individual culture should merge, should align with the organizational culture at Thompson Concrete. And this is where you bring your best, your excellence every day. You don't have to be a sports celebrity. You don't have to be a famous person. You just have to be the best you you can be. And you know that if you deal with that and deal with you, and I talked a lot about what people bring to the table in terms of some of their challenges, but if you work on you and if you allow other people to help you through that process, you and the company will be better off. So hopefully you've enjoyed this presentation. If you want to get in touch with me, feel free to reach me uh, by, at my office and then also my email, and then you can also check out our website. So it's been an honor. Thank you, Thompson Concrete, the employees, the staff. Uh, it's been a great, uh, uh, a wonderful uh, opportunity for me to just share some, some nuggets, some wisdom when it comes to being a, a collaborative uh, work environment and also being able to build bridges when there are language barriers. All right. Thank you. God bless.